Um, I will probably have time for questions at the end, so if you uh, are interested in submitting them, you can uh, submit them to Slido um, at slido.com. Um, so it's been about a year since I've been up here, um, and I kind of wanted to discuss the things that we've done in the past, uh, over the past year, where we came from, where we are today, and what it is we're trying to do for the future. So about this time this uh, last year, I was talking about how we came out of Google. Uh, we started about seven years ago, mostly out of the Geo team, where we built Google Earth Maps um, and a whole host of other um, components that make up maps today. Um, we started out at Keyhole, John and I, and a couple of others, and uh, where we built the predecessor to Google Earth. Um, so we've been doing map type stuff for about 20 something years. Um, and really trying to find ways to get people to understand the world around them. One of the things we looked for when we, when we were working on this project was we, we were looking around the world around us, especially our kids, and we saw them spending a lot of time in front of their screens. Um, this New Yorker article actually hangs in our office uh, in San Francisco, and it sort of highlights the effect. You have the kids sitting in front of their screens, playing Minecraft, simulating an outdoor environment, and outside, is this beautiful landscape that they can be participating in. Um, so we look for ways to get people outside, explore the world around them, get a little exercise along the way, and enjoy the experience in the company of others. We started with a little app called Field Trip. Uh, probably a lot of you don't know much about it. Um, it, was, it was a way to deliver highly curated georeference content uh, in, an, in, a, in a passive fashion. As you walk around the world, Field Trip gives you interesting tidbits about the world that's lying beneath you. Um, we tied it with um, Thrillist, for example. Uh, one of the initial providers of content for it was a company called Arcadia Books, which built these little 44-page pamphlets. Uh, they're, they're written by local experts in their local communities, and it provides a, a great way to get that content under people's hands. Uh, one of the things we did with, with um, Field Trip was to explore AR as a way to give this uh, content in an unobtrusive way while people are wandering around the world. And that was back in 2013. We followed that up with, with Ingress, which was our, our game as a way to motivate people to get outside. Um, with that, we created uh, what we feel is a pretty engaging global game, and we feel it's engaging because the people that play it haven't stopped playing it since they started. The, the number of users that continue to play today um, has been relatively consistent, even though we haven't changed the game in almost two years. Um, the key feature of Ingress was that we mapped virtual game locations with physical objects in the real world. Uh, we tied that. We, all of those physical objects, every single one of them, was submitted by players. Um, and we've curated about six million of them so far. And uh, we're about to turn on more submissions in the future, which will allow us to get an even bigger inflow, primarily through Pokemon Go. Um, we also added another thing, and that's what this little object is that I'm holding in my hand. Um, we've, we've actually used uh, IoT technology to actually allow people to build objects that they can uh, control with the game. And you'll see two of them down at the lower right-hand side of the screen. Uh, last, last weekend, we had a camping trip um, out in Camp Navarro. There, I think there were 22, 24 different artworks that people created. They tied this little thing they call a Techthulhu, which is essentially a Raspberry Pi with some other electronics. And they can plug it into these in the game. Taking actions in the game actually causes these things to take particular actions. And actually, there is a, there's a sculpture in downtown San Jose that we drive, um, although it's not currently tied in the game. And there are other, uh, Itoen um, actually explored this possibility with um, vending machines in Japan. They have, uh, I think, three of them. That, that are actual portals in the game, you go up, you interact with it, and it will actually change colors and uh, display an interesting sequence with it. To this, we also added field trip content, um, so we can foster um, more exploration. Uh, field trip has really, really interesting content about the world. Um, in fact, Niantic was one of the, the, the sh is actually a ship that's buried under the Transamerica Tower, or was buried, and it is one of the key features that, that showed up, would have shown up in field trip. Um, like I said, uh, we have some incredibly loyal fans. And lastly, um, Ingress, when we started, had the only revenue model we were exploring with that product was sponsored locations. We had no in-app purchase, which is what everybody else was doing. We really wanted to try something different. And uh, so we added this model of sponsored locations. And we started out with uh, SoftBank and Itoen and just other 
Other, primarily in Japan, we had a couple here in the United States um, as well, and we carried that over into Pokemon Go. The other thing we did with Ingress was we wanted to foster this sense of community. Uh, how do we bring people together? Because part of what we really wanted people to do was really explore the world together. And so we created these things called events. They started out with a really small one, Cahokia Mounds in 2013. It was relatively small, about less than 100 people. Um, we ended up growing that over time um, to events that, that have uh, you know, tens of thousands of people in them. Um, in fact, this Tokyo one on the lower right, which happened just prior the Pokemon Go launch last summer had 10,000 people show up for it. Um, the core of these events, um, it's, it's about uh, community gameplay, competitive gameplay, that happens over the course of three months. We have a three-month arc. It starts out with localized um, operations, uh, all culminating in a large um, operation at the very end. And they're largely, the, the ends are largely fan conventions. Um, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, there's the guy with the uh, green and white balloons. Um, he's been at every single Japan-based event dressed just like that. Um, and there's many, many other people who come totally decked out in whoever their favorite character is or their particular character. We have a bio card that people can create as well. So what we learned with Ingress, we learned what it takes to build an engaging real world game. We, we learned how to leverage players to, uh, to create our game board. We figured out how to foster a sense of community around these games, how to bring people together. Um, there are some interesting game mechanics in Ingress that uh, create emergent gameplay that we really never expected. We really hoped it would happen, and it did, uh, where you end up with, with individuals called operators who control, who issue command and control over large numbers of fleets of people. Um, that's sort of the keystone of many of these events. Um, and they, they spend months actually planning these events um, and executing them um, while running around cities, making this stuff happen. Um, we discovered from Ingress what it was needed for a successful platform. When we started Ingress and Field Trip, our original goal was to create a platform from this, but we knew going into it that we would have no clue how to build that. We'd end up building something that would be pretty much useless in the end and have to start over again. So instead, we focused entirely on game mechanics, um, sponsorship model for how you make money, um, not using the standard model which everybody else uses. And um, from that, we learned how to build a new platform. And we threw pretty much everything that we had written for Ingress away, and we started over. And uh, built a new software platform. And the goal of that was um, to increase, increase its efficiency, to improve the player's experience, and reduce our operating costs by 10x, because um, Ingress was pretty expensive. That led to Pokemon Go. And uh, this is actually a video. I don't know if they're going to play it. Um, this video, what it shows, is uh, a run for Snorlax in tai Taiwan City. Um, there it goes. Um, there are literally thousands of people running across the street. Traffic stopped. Um, and there were events like this all over the world. Um, there was one in uh, Central Park. Pretty soon after we launched, it had um, hundreds of people, but it doesn't really show you the magnitude like this particular scene does. Um, in San Francisco, a week after we launched the product there, uh, we ended up with um, about 9,000 people who showed up, just spuriously organized themselves as a community, and, and uh, marched through San Francisco, um, something we had no control over. It was very re refreshing, though. We had this while we're going on. Um, what we did with Pokemon Go was we leveraged our key learnings from Ingress. It was the first product that we, we created on the new platform. Um, it's still a culture, it's, it was a cultural phenomenon when it, when it launched, um, but today it's still a hit game, as evidenced by the chart um, on the right. Um, one of the things we encountered along the way was, was we, we found a lot of bottlenecks. We ran into just about everyone you could have. Um, not only in our, our software, but in software for other people. Um, people outside the organization, Google. Um, in fact, if you read the Google SRE book, you'll see us mentioned in one of, the, uh, one of those bottlenecks. Um, but the wild ride that we experienced proved that the architecture that we had constructed for this platform um, would scale, and it exceeded our goals um, pretty substantially. Um, 
Then we created Pokemon Go events. Um, we had this, we had Pokemon Go Fest last summer. Probably many of you probably heard about it. Um, it was in Chicago. Um, most people talk about how it wasn't successful. But what the team did in that particular instance was they responded to the problems with network infrastructure by moving people out of the park and allowing them to play and have a great experience. And if you talk to people who actually were there, yes, the initial couple of hours were really painful, but what happened afterwards was really remarkable. And we took what we learned at the GoFest and we took that to the Pikachu outbreak, which was in Yokohama. And the, the outbreak was pretty significant because it was the largest, <laughs> Largest event we'd ever seen. Um, I, I should have put pictures up here, but there are pictures. Literally, I'm looking out my hotel window, and I can't see the concrete because there are so many people walking across this bridge to get onto this island. Um, that was when we launched Mewtwo. Uh, we had a stadium event. We tried to make it as, as similar to what um, the, the gym type experiences looks like. Um, and everybody that I talked to while I was there had an amazing time. And we took that to Safari Zone. And again, one of the things that we had to do along the way was we had to respond to player behavior, things that happened in the game, network problems along the way, system problems along the way, and fixing those in real time, learning from those and incorporating them into the platform as we went. And all in all, in 2017, that's just 2017, we've supported about 3.8 million people participating in these events. And we're going to take all of that, and we're going to pour that into Harry Potter Wizards Unite. We've been creating um, new AR experiences for that particular product, and we'll show some of what we're up to in the next couple of weeks. And because I don't want to steal any of the thunder, um, I'm not going to talk about it there, here. Um, when we talk about the things that we built, um, we measure our success in how many kilometers people walk. I mean, our goal is to get people outside and exercising. Uh, kilometers walk gives us a pretty good idea of how well we're doing. We feel pretty comfortable stating that our players have walked more than um, those of all other AR titles combined. Um, in this particular case, we have 340 million kilometers walked, and that's just for Ingress. And last May, we announced Pokemon Go, which was at 15 billion kilometers, which is almost to Pluto and back. Um, so in building a platform, people talk, well, people talk about tech a lot, a lot. They talk about the platforms they're going to build, but they don't really talk about the applications they're going to create. We started with our mission of finding ways to get people outside, exploring, getting a little exercise, and doing it together. And we, we, we decided the way to do that was not to build a platform for that. It was to build applications and understand it. It's similar to the way that AWS and GCP were built. They, they weren't built as a compute platform for everybody to start up. They were built to support the, um, the applications that Amazon and Google were, were, sell, were putting in front of users. And they decided, we have excess capacity. Let's turn it into something that our users can use. Plus, we have a market that people are going to move into this space. So let's go ahead and do it. We're pretty good at doing this stuff. They packaged all the infrastructure that they have, and, and they put it into a commercial uh, accessible um, place. And then, hence comes their platform. We thought we'd use the same model. And with so few companies building AR applications at scale, I thought I'd share some of what we built so far. So this is the platform in a high-level diagram. And I'll go through some of the pieces that sort of make that up. So for Planet Scale AR, you need a platform that does streamable maps for highly interactive clients worldwide, having appropriate places to explore or play. A single persistent world because the real world isn't sharded. Systems that allow people to communicate and coordinate. Um, managing people traffic so the infrastructure doesn't collapse. Highly, highly dynamic yet low cost systems for many users. Rapid scaling to accommodate fast changes in demand. Ingesting and distributing many terabytes of data, sometimes in real time. Managing many petabytes of stored data. Dealing with spoofers, bots, and scraping. Establishing customer service for a lot of users. Coordinating with property owners, creating engaging events that support local communities, interesting world world locations to anchor your game into, and in-game location sponsorship. So, and I'll talk about some other challenges that I haven't listed on this that we're working on right now, and we'll be discussing those in a couple of weeks. I thought I'd highlight a couple of them. So maps. Everybody thinks the map is just the thing on the screen. Um, there's actually two different, two different types. Um, high-level types. There's human-readable and machine-readable. Most people know the human-readable. But the machine-readable ones are actually more important. They describe the place 
And, um, <clears throat> well, first, to create a human map like these takes actually many months. There are a lot of things you have to take out, a lot of things you put in. Um, Deriving the machine maps are a whole different problem because they have to capture what it is you're trying to convey to the machine. They have to describe more than, more than just where things are, but they have to pr produce what and the why. For example, everybody's talking about AR Cloud. AR Cloud is largely a 3D map that describes the location of objects in, in the world that can be perceived by a camera. Um, there are other maps. Pokemon Go's Pokemon are actually spawned because we know generally what's at a particular location. There's a map that describes that for us. Um, that's, that's just some inst instances of, of the maps that you have to use in order to create these types of applications. It's an understanding of the world around you. Interesting places. Field Trip has uh, content that is curated and submitted by experts. Places are curated and submitted by players. And the players are, players are really the explorers of their community. Um, we've been doing submissions and updates since 2012. It was integral to the creation of Ingress. And uh, the frequency continues to increase over time. And as we turn on submissions, we'll see that go up dramatically. And the reason why we believe that is really important is because the world changes a lot. Um, and lastly, we have to build a dynamic and low-cost system. Uh, Ingress showed that um, AR games can be expensive to operate. And we set a goal for ourselves to reduce that by 10x. We actually achieved 50 with Pokemon Go. And without that focus, Pokemon Go would not have survived. We would have not, we would have cost, it would have cost us too much money or we could not have gotten the resources necessary in order to make that happen. Um, and just for general measure, Pokemon Go at launch supported millions of active users, actually many millions, and many tens of millions of daily actives. Um, so a key lesson for Planet Scale AR, technology is only a small part of the whole picture. Success is dependent upon your users because they're the ones who are helping you build this thing and they're actually the ones who are playing it. Too few users collecting data for you results in something akin to a game of checkers with 90% of the board missing. And uh, users, they're really the explorers. They're your experts, the local experts. They're going to help you understand the world around you. <clears throat> and if you give them something engaging that they can participate in, they'll help you do that. That, that they really will. And we're trying to create a platform not just for our applications. Um, our goal. Was to, is our, our mission for our company is, is not just to create games. In fact, our mission statement has nothing in it about games. Our mission statement is about getting people outside, exploring the world around them, getting a little exercise on the, along the way, and having fun while they're doing it with other people. And to achieve this, we believe, requires the creation of a plethora of experiences, not just our own. And that requires many contributors, which means a platform is needed to make this a reality. So when you're, when you're successful, your ability to scale will matter a lot. A single consistent world enables social interaction, and AR depends upon people using your app, filling in the blanks. Thank you.